I want to talk to you as fellow HR people. How I started out in, in HR was I was a recruiter. I worked for very large global um, corporations. And I worked my way through my HR career to be a startup kind of gal. And um, as I started doing startup kind of gal stuff, I started doing HR very differently. So if you've read some of the stuff that I helped work on with the Netflix Culture Deck or the article that I wrote for the Harvard Business Review, you'll know that I'm a little bit radical. So I'm going to start today by asking you to suspend what you do and how you've learned to do it and the great professionals that you are and come along with me on a little bit of a journey. Um, and this is my theme. But here's what I learned to do differently and I want to teach you guys a little bit about how I think about it. You know, I think sometimes in HR, we sort of wear, if I had a helmet on it, it would have a rear view mirror if I was a professional HR person. I would say, what are our best practices? How do I look back at how we've always done this before and make it a little bit better? And I want you to just leave that for a second and say to yourself, what if in everything that we did, we began with the end in mind? What if we said we want to work in companies and create companies and be part of companies that have amazing people in them, who are passionate about what they do, who make incredible contributions, and the results are absolutely palpable and measurable? How would you do that? Well, first you'd think like a business person. What are your outcomes, right? In a business, you have many ways to determine whether or not you're successful. Metrics. Um, you should know the metrics of your organization. What are they? Is it profit? Is it cost savings? Is it growth? You know, how is it that you're going to determine how the company is succeeding? Metrics usually involve numerals, in case you don't know that. So esoteric, like employees will be happy and engaged, is not a metric. That's that's an objective, okay? I'm going to do some market. You need to know what your market is, who your competitors are, what the landscape is. You need to be able to think like an investor so that you would understand when there are market forces that are changing your business or other things outside of the organization that are changing the landscape that which you operate, that you understand that. You need to understand what your contribution is either to your industry or to society. And again, back to the metrics. Uh, in, within the context of all of that, what are your timelines, what are your deliverables, what are your milestones for the business? Remember, I haven't said HR yet, right? And then your job, our job, is to translate how do humans pull that off, right? So what you need to think about before you start thinking about what kind of degree or skills and experience does it take to fill this open position is what do people actually do? So I grew up in Silicon Valley, and I grew up in technology. And very often when I interview HR people, I ask them, you know, what, what does your business do? Oh, we were, we're a bunch of engineers and we make software. And I say, have you ever sat next to an engineer while they write code? Oh, well, no, no, I'm not technical. Do you know what motivates them? Do you know what drives them? Do you know what that is? Do you know that they make pictures and websites and interactive things out of numbers? Zeros and ones, it's crazy stuff, right? It's like writing music when they write code. Do you know that? Do you sit next to people? Do you know what they actually do? A very important part of creating great, talented organization is to understand the time frames of your business. So I got asked this morning, how do you feel about career development if you have a team or a group of people who you think are really great, and, but they could be better, and how, do you, how much do you invest in career development or training? And I said, it depends completely on the time frame. If you need somebody to know something that they don't know over a period of years, that's a great investment. If you need somebody to know somebody that they don't know or have no experience in in another three months, that's a tough one to do. So time frame's important. You need to work, come into work every day and look around the people that you work with and say, what slows them down? Because I spend a lot of time with forward-thinking startups and I spend a lot of time with people who are inventing the new world. And here's what I know for sure the new world has that the old world doesn't. Speed. Right? And so if, if our job is to create processes and um, policies that stop people from doing the work that they do that matters, we are responsible for slowing our business down. So think about that. And then, you know, what's optimal operation? 
a lot of times we're being asked to figure out or coach people around organizational design. And so we pull out all these templates that we have in our head without beginning with the end in mind, which is, if it was amazing, if, this t if your team, if your company, if your department was amazing, what would it look like? So that's why you think optimal, not just better. You have to be a business leader first. And that's the thing that I think when I talk to HR teams is the most significant mindset change that is the most empowering and the funnest part about being HR person in the future. You're a part of the business, you're a leader. You're not a facilitator for other leaders, you're one that de demonstrates leadership every day. And people will emulate your behavior because you're really good at it. So sometimes we say, oh, well, you know, I'm kind of the coach behind the scenes, it's not really my job. But it's not true, and it's a lot more fun when you get to be the leader. So I want to talk to you a little bit about invention, because that's where I grew up. And I think sometimes we think of ourselves as uh, implementers, but I want to tell you some stories about inventors, because I got to be around them. I want to tell you the story about the iPad at Netflix. So Reed Hastings, who's the CEO that I worked with, came to us in, oh, I don't know. 2008, whenever the iPad came out. And he said, hey, guess who called me this morning? We're like, I don't know, God, I don't know who calls you, Reed? He's like, Steve Jobs. We're like, ooh, that's pretty impressive. What did Steve have to say? He said, well, Steve is inventing this new device. And we all knew that some kind of tablet was coming out of, I, out of Apple because they had invented the iPhone and we knew that the next device was going to be a tablet. And, he, and we're like, oh, really? And what did Steve say about the new device? And he said, well, he wants us to be on it because he thinks that video streaming is going to be a really important part of the new device and he wants us to be a part of it. And we're like, oh, right, right, we're going to be, we're going to be one of the first apps on, the, on this new device. It's really cool. He goes, yeah, and they need it in 90 days. <laughs> and we're like, I'm like, okay, you know, um, so these five things that are really critically important to the business, we're not going to do any of those. We're not going to do one of them. We're going to put the iPad in front of it, or the device. Let me say the device. He's like, no, we still have to do all those things. Like, well, do we know what the technology stack is? No. Do we know what the actual due date is? It's Apple, they're secretive about it, right? <laughs> oh, and by the way, only five people in the company are allowed to go to Apple to be led into the secret room and behold what we are now to refer to as the transformational device. <laughs> I'm serious, right? So I go back to my engineering team. I'm like, okay, guys, you know, what about this? What about this? What about this? It's, as far as I'm concerned, it's impossible, right? And they're like, they get this gleam in their eyes that engineers get when you tell them they can't do something, <laughs> right? It's like, we're doing it, man. I'm like, okay, okay, I'll get out the midnight oil, right? So this team of people works night and day for 90 days and we deliver the iPad app and we're all crowded around the laptop when he announces it at Macworld and the first thing he demonstrates is Netflix on the iPad, right? Oh my God. <laughs> so fast forward, um, I don't know, a couple of months and I walk into the engineering meeting and I'm doing what I do when I get really excited about stuff. I'm like, oh my God, the iPad is really a transformational device. I, have, I mean, touch, touch is the most amazing technology. It's so primal. Like last night, it was at a restaurant, and a two-year-old was like streaming SpongeBob from their high chair. I mean, get out, right? And my mom is binge watching Meerkat Manor because she's sick. You know, my mom couldn't figure out how to use the auto teller, but she can use the iPad, right? And so I said, I can't imagine what it's going to be like on the day I walk into my media room and I swipe my wall. And immediately they start doing this. Oh man, we're not gonna get, make you get up. No, you're gonna walk in, you're gonna sit on your couch. Somebody else goes, you're gonna have your smartphone. Oh yeah, and your smartphone's gonna have like an app on it that's like a Moodle meter, and you're gonna put your thumb on it. It's gonna go, oh Patty, you're sad. Do you need a comedy? And then automatically a comedy's gonna, a romantic comedy's gonna start streaming with all my favorite actors. And I'm like, oh. And I realized I was in the room with people who could do that. Right? They could do that. I mean, it made me have chills. And I was already pretty far along in the radical stuff that I was doing in HR by then. Right? I'd gotten rid of time off. I'd gotten rid of expense policies. I changed the performance review process. But just being around them inspired me to think, they never said, let's take 
regular television and see if we can make it just a smidge better. <laughs> right? They imagined that experience. And one of these days when you guys go into your media room and you're holding your device with your Mudo meter, don't you remember? I told you. And I probably know the person that invented it. So we can do this too. Ima inventors imagine what will be and then they go there. They don't copy everyone else. Inventors don't have the term best practices, right? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about HR terms that I've learned to loathe. So don't, don't hate me, right? And it doesn't mean I'm picking on you. It just means some of these things make me crazy. Okay, best practices based on what? Right, some, something somebody did 10 years ago that seemed to work for them that we all do now. Like, we all have different companies, but it's the best practice. Because we practice it a lot, so it must be best. <laughs> Engineers, inventors, innovators, they solve for a better way. Right? They don't solve for consistency. My daughter's a baker. Consistency is really important when you're making cake batter. It's pretty much it. Right? The, the dictionary term for consistency is the same. So just because you have consistency does not mean you have optimal process. It just means that everybody does it the same way. And if that's important to you, I'm not knocking that. But you want to step back and go, is, being, is having consistency a goal worth achieving? Because it might just mean doing things the same. Inventors look to the future. Right? They don't have that rear view mirror. They say, what can be? What can we be? How can we think about it? Inventors fail sometimes. Right? We are conditioned to be afraid of failure. Compliance does not have failure in it. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that, you know, I, I'm not encouraging anybody to break the law, for God's sake. But compliance for compliance sake might mean that you're not willing to try something new and be afraid, and, and you're afraid to try something and fail. And lastly, I want to talk about the HR term that I really like the least. It's very popular when you've all said it. It's called empowerment. We're going to empower our employees. It sort of reminds me like we have the, we're the HR fairies. You're empowered. <laughs> How do you feel about that, huh? Because I've empowered you. The truth is we all have power. Every single person who comes to work every single day walks in the door with power, and we can take it away, but we can't give it to them, right? And so I think that we've created this term called empowerment, which somehow means we're going to give it to them. And I, I think that, you know, maybe if we just thought about that differently, what if we took away all the stuff that takes away their power? <laughs> It's a crazy idea, huh? But, you know, those are the things that I kind of lay up awake at night and think about. So I want to talk to you about some practically speaking, you know, some tips for you from the stuff that I've tried and learned. I want to tell you that the Netflix way is not a religion. I do believe that the word cult is in culture, just so you know, so I'm, I'm okay with that. But I want to just share with you some stuff that I've tried, and it doesn't mean that I'm saying everybody should go implement all these things all of the time, but I want you to just think about them a little differently. The first thing I talk to all my companies about is what I call the heartbeat of communication. And that is, if you start with how I started with your business person to begin with, and you understand what the business objectives are, that's called the context of how people work. How do you make sure that people get information about how their business works, like the beating of a heart? Do you have quarterly meetings? Do you have monthly meetings? Do you have weekly meetings? Do you have one-on-ones? Do you have team meetings? Do you have department meetings? Are the objectives of those meetings clear? Do I know that every quarter I'm going to be in a meeting with my department head who's going to talk to me about the metrics of our organization and if we've achieved them and what we need to do to accomplish that? And I think one of the most important things we can do in HR is recognize what the heartbeat is and also recognize when it needs to change. So as organizations grow, as you become global, as it becomes complex, the way you communicate is going to have to change.